Hi everyone, and welcome to this uh, online webinar, which is uh, hosted by Law Ninjas as well as Prestall 360. Uh, my name is Rohan Bilimori, and I'm the founder of this platform called Law Ninjas, which uh, is essentially a community of lawyers and law students around the world. And uh, today I'm really, really excited about this session because the Presol 360 team are amazing and they're fantastic. Uh, and Aman today is going to be our moderator and I'll let him introduce our speakers and what the session is all about. But maybe if I can just take a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about Presol 360, because I think what they're doing is not only cutting edge, but it's also solving a real need within our legal industry. So by way of summary, Presol 360, it's an online dispute resolution platform, which essentially offers technology-driven solutions for resolving commercial as well as contractual disputes. Their platform allows enterprises to resolve disputes with their stakeholders out of court and capitalize on bespoke offerings such as smart case management, workflow automation, data-driven dri insights, blockchain-based validation, which sounds pretty cool, and also digital tools resulting in significantly reduced cost, time, and effort. Uh, their team or their company was incubated by CAM, which is a leading Indian law firm, and their solution has been adopted by over 40, 40 enterprises so far, including everyone from leading banks to financial institutions to startups and e-commerce players. So, Without further ado, let me hand over to Aman, who's one of the co-founders of Presol 360. And I hope you all enjoy this session. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rohan, uh, for that warm and kind introduction and uh, for giving us this platform to you know, discuss about a topic which is very interesting, uh, something which has now become a buzzword and uh, ODR is what uh, you know everyone is all talking about online dispute resolution and how ODR can actually be used as a business friendly approach to resolve disputes. But uh, before I can actually kickstart our discussion, I think it'll be great for me to quickly introduce each of our esteemed panelists out here. Uh, so we have Justice Pradeep Nandrajok with us, uh, who is the former Chief Justice of uh, Bombay High Court. He's also the former Chief Justice of Rajasthan High Court and a judge at the Delhi High Court. So apart from having an illustrious career of over 18 years at the bench, uh, he has also spent over 21 years at the bar. So uh, you're coming here with some great uh, experience and so your insights would be quite, uh, uh, you know, quite useful for all of us from different backgrounds, but more or less, I think most of the people from the legal fraternity. So thank, thank you, you so Aman, much for joining for the us. kind words. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then next we have Mr. Sarath Mohan, uh, who is currently a senior VP at HDFC Bank Limited. Uh, he's also heading the retail legal team, comprising of over 400 members uh, and over 300 external lawyers across India. Uh, he himself began his career uh, as a trial advocate and now has been over 25 years experience in the finance and banking industry. Uh, he's also had uh, the legal teams at ICICI Bank and India Bulls Credit Services. So very grateful to uh, you, Mr. Sarath, for joining us. Thanks, and, thanks Aman, for the generous introduction. Thank you, thank you. And last but not the least, uh, we have Ms. Komal Gupta. She is the Chief Innovation Officer of Citizen Amachan Mangaldas. Uh, she has been leading the innovation and AI initiative. In fact, uh, she's been actively involved in establishing the innovation lab, uh, as well as India's first AI-enabled legal tech incubator, Prarambh, I'm sure everyone in the legal industry is aware about. And uh, she has been reshaping the face of the legal industry. So it'll be great to have your views, Komal, in this entire uh, panel discussion about ODR and how technology can actually reshape the way disputes are resolved. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Aman, for the kind introduction. Yes, so great. And and uh, Rohan has given an introduction about me, but uh, just to uh, tell you a bit more. Uh, so I'm the co-founder of Resolve 360. We have built India's first ODR platform in the country. 
Uh, we have been enlisted by the Department of Justice. Uh, we are also impaneled by various courts in the country. So we've been fortunate enough to not only get the support of corporates, MSMEs to use our platform, but even the courts are now uh, you know, referring matters when it comes to mediations, whether it is court annexed or pre-installation. Uh, and, you know, uh, I would, I, I mean, I'm sure there would be a lot of questions, a lot of curiosity amongst uh, all the participants. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to address them at the end of the session. And you can probably just put down all your questions in the chat option and uh, to whoever you would want to address to out of our panelists and uh, we'd be happy to take that up later on. So let us just quickly begin with this uh, panel discussion and before I do that I would love to start with an anecdote. Uh, you know I remember in late 2016 when we were laying a groundwork for building an ODR platform in the country and we even decided to quit our cozy corporate jobs and had just one mission in mind and how do we improve access to justice in the country and it wasn't that easy in fact we uh, we were seriously advised by a lot of people that we should give up this idea uh, resolving disputes in india without courts papers lawyers it was just something which cannot be imagined and perhaps we were a bit ahead of the time, maybe at that time, the time was not right. And I yet remember we had about 3.5 crore cases pending at that time. And fast forward to 2022, I think the problem has just gotten worse. And with the pandemic, with the more mounting pendencies, five crore cases now, which are pending in the courts. And now it's a time where the thought process has changed. I think more or less, every stakeholder has realized the importance of using technology in aiding quick and cost-effective resolutions. And that has been a key shift in perspective. And so my first question, uh, Justice Pandeep Nandrajok, to you, that when we see, when we look at this entire shift, uh, you know, it has happened because uh, think tanks like Niti Aayog, uh, the judiciary, everyone is getting involved and, you know, uh, people are coming together and figuring a way of how do we get technology involved in the entire judicial process. And uh, in fact, Niti Aayog in their uh, recent reports so that they had a policy plan for ODR and they stated, and I would love to quote that out here, that justice is now no longer associated with a place and that is courts but rather as a service that can be provided at parties' convenience. So according to you, what were the factors that actually brought this shift and what, what made that shift of perspective? It's like this, Aman. <clears throat> this issue of use of technology in dispute resolution goes back to 1965. In fact, the Japanese were the first to try with it. They tried to create a system which they called was jury matrix. And why it was so? Because if we see there has been a constant graphic upward movement of pendency. Of this. Every year when we look at the data, we find that in spite of social strength being increased, within the resources of the government from time to time, the pendency has gone up. So it's very obvious if there is a traffic jam on the highway, what do you do as a driver? You try to look to a violin, you put your car on the side curb, but they are in the nature of desperate measures. Polemics, yes. Who can deny that timely justice is not important? Who can deny the fact that of all the human requirements, one of the most important requirement is justice and timely justice. And if that fails, then everything fails. And let me give a very simple little example. If a plaintiff sues a defendant for, say, one lakh rupees and he gets a decree after 20 years, 
even with say 9% rate of interest, is he compensated? No. The opportunity costs which he has lost. If he had that one lakh rupees in his hand 20 years back, well, he may not have put it in a bank and just earned interest out of it. He could have invested it in a business. He could have spent it on the education of his child. He could have done so many things. Now, <clears throat> therefore, to look for alternatives and ODR being one of them became the necessity, became the compulsion of the system for we had to do two things. It had to be timely. It had to be cost effective. ODR is one where both coincide and it's a platform which is geared to achieve the desired purpose for which Dura Matrix started. We must also, when we take things forward, we must look at why is it that it failed at some stage? Why is it that the Japanese left it? They left Jury Matrix. They left it. it. They found that it was not serving the purpose. Probably when they left it, we did not have artificial intelligence, blockchain technologies coming up at the level at which they have developed today. Therefore, you must take small steps at a time. And I find that in disputes, which if I may use the phrase, standard form contracts, then it would be extremely helpful. Say higher purchase, financing, loans. There it would be extremely helpful. Check bouncing cases of a repetitive nature. But probably maybe as we cross those paths, then even complex matters are capable of being resolved. But you have to do it with a lot of care and caution. Sum it up by this. It's a good platform. It's the need of the day. It's very, very essential. And with technology, artificial intelligence growing, make your start with these, what I call is standard form contracts, disputes arising out of that. And that the financial institutions. In fact, if you would see the data of cases pending before the magistrate, 30 to 40% are the cases which are filed under the Negotiable Instruments Act. Right. And I am quite confident that each of these cases, by each I mean 99% of them are capable of being resolved on the ODR forms. No, absolutely. I, I, I completely agree with your viewpoint. In fact, uh, learn something new uh, about the jury matrix that you spoke about, uh, you know, in 1965, I, that means the Japanese were way ahead of its time. We, we were thinking that we were doing something disruptive, but uh, for this to be, you know, incorporated at that time, this is, this is some great information. And uh, totally agree with you that at least to begin with uh, a certain kind of disputes, certain kind of contracts where ODR could be absolutely conducive. And I, and I think we've, we've begun on that note. And, and, you know, while we got this great perspective from you, somebody who has spent so much time at the bench, uh, Komal, I would love to understand from you that how does the legal fraternity perceive ODR? You know, is it is it something that they are looking at it as a tool for efficient redressal, complementing their current legal services? So I am going to talk about lawyers across the country and not just, you know, we are not talking about just metropolitan uh, cities. I think there are three buckets that we have. One who is not aware at all. Unfortunately, that is the vast majority who is not aware of ODR. The second is who is aware, but doesn't want to use it, doesn't think that it is time, it is necessary to use it at all. And the third is 
I know it, I'm aware, I have used it, whether when I participated in an international arbitration, therefore I was asked to use it, or whether out of my own interest and awareness, I know how to use it. My clients, you know, my banks, my financial institutions that I represent, I was to, made to use the technology, and I have found the technology to be very useful, and therefore I will use it. So now there are these three categories. And, uh, you know, I feel that uh, there is no doubt, there is no question about this, whether it is useful or not, whether it will be an enabler for practitioners or not, and not just for practitioners, also for our clients. But we need to address this vast majority of unawareness. We need to, uh, you know, as uh, ODR platforms and as lawyers who are, you know, aware and who have experienced and understand that this is going to be useful, we need to create that awareness and not just awareness, we also, you know, lawyers, uh, or for that matter, any customer, let's treat for, for an ODR platform, let's treat a lawyer as your client, you know, customer. What do we want? Even when I want to go and buy a pen from a shop, you know, I want to use it. I want to make sure that it's a good quality, stable. So the, pretty much the same thing for an ODR platform where there is no awareness, we need to create awareness, but also we've got to give a flavor of how that entire process works. And, you know, once that, uh, once that usage happens and you know that um, I hear it from a few champions that yeah this works that's when the uh, trust in the system uh, is going to grow and that's when you'll find the majority slowly very slowly I cannot you know I cannot say that it's going to happen drastically immediately but slowly we will see that shift and we'll have more people on the other side so I think uh, to conclude and answer this in short definitely useful for the lawyers uh, and those who are using it are uh, benefiting out of it those who are not using it should start considering it and should uh, you know uh, and the third category who's just not aware we have that responsibility of making them aware i i i, I agree with that i think uh, you know over a span of uh, five years now you know trying to tr trying to create awareness i think we've not even touched the surface and and that's that's exactly what you mentioned, right? That large large majority of uh, uh, you know the crowd is yet not aware, or even if they are aware, they don't really see or look at this as you know a tool which could actually aid or which would which could complement, you know. So uh, I think an important point that you mentioned that there has to be those champions uh, coming in and those champions talking about it, and that's how. You know the industry starts following and and the trend starts from there and Absolutely. speaking of that uh, i think that's exactly where you know i would love to ask mr sarath about his experience because i think when it comes to embracing odr firsthand and when it comes to you know leading from the front the hdfc bank has always been at the forefront when it comes to any sort of digital transformation and uh, you have actually walked the talk by being one of the first banks in the country to actually adopt ODR into your dispute resolution mechanism. So would love to understand from you, Mr. Sarath, that how this entire integration has been, and if you can share your experience so far with whatever you have seen. Yeah, <clears throat> so basically what we've done is we've done two projects under ODR with PreSol, one of which is an e-mediation project, and the other is an online arbitration, uh, which we have done with them. So it so happens that we started it in 2019. In, in fact, the arbitration fees, where we ran a pilot project commencing from 2019. So being a pilot project, we did uh, some, it was not a huge bulk of uh, cases that were assigned, but whatever we did, we wanted to understand how it works and how it suits us as an organization that deals with a lot of volumes of litigation. So we tried that project and in between, I think uh, COVID came in. So two years of uh, time got lost somewhere. And again, somehow we were able to complete it uh, by 2021. So if you look at the results of arbitration project, it was very encouraging because it helped <clears throat> us understand the platform better. We got insights into how, how we should go about doing this. And even the <clears throat> response from customers as compared to our traditional arbitration that we typically do, 
uh, uh, was much better than the traditional arbitration. So currently we are at a point that where we have decided that we'll take this forward. Though um, we might not migrate entirely the arbitration piece that we are dealing with to uh, uh, online arbitration, we will, in a steady and a very phased manner, we will go about doing the migration. So that's the plan in so far as uh, online arbitration is concerned. When it comes to e-mediation, we have definitely seen gains. That was something we started post-COVID. In fact, it's hardly two quarters uh, since we started our uh, journey with e-mediation. There we have assigned uh, a little more higher quantity of cases and we've seen very good results. In fact, uh, the recovery, the responses from customers, all, uh, it it's in fact very very encouraging so we are doing it as an ongoing activity a um, lot more cases would be assigned to that segment and uh, i think that there is a path there for both of these platforms arbitration as well as e mediation and as a way forward we certainly look forward to put more uh, or uh, depend more on these uh, recourses because we are, there are certain issues with arbitration which all of us would, uh, most of us would know uh, and appreciate, but this is actually a forum. It helps in a lot of ways. The effort is lesser. In fact, one third of the manpower that is required for doing a normal arbitration is required here. It is paperless. It's convenient for the bank as well as the customer also to participate because the seat of adjudication is no longer there the complexities of jurisdiction, these things go away. So it's very, very convenient from a bank perspective. Uh, so we certainly have a way forward in uh, both of these um, projects. So we are more or less standardizing it and bringing it into our mainstream legal uh, projects that we have. Uh, absolutely. I think it was... Uh, I, while you were speaking, uh, all those uh, images of our initial conversations yeah. and, and how many uh, rounds of convincing negotiation <laughs> that took place, it was all running in front of me. So I, I, I can, I can, I can just you know go back to those days. But yes, as you rightly said, I think e arbitration was something that uh, I think both of us were convinced that yes, that is yeah. the way forward, and and that pilot worked out very successfully. But yeah. to be what was attractive honest, among here, I would just like to interject yes. the, the, the way the platform was created. In fact, when you came to us for the first time, I still remember the kind of conversation we were, how sustainable is this? And then uh, what impressed me was you had a proper legal backing to the entire thing, how to go about uh, doing <laughs> it and what are the, <laughs> the legal opinions, etc. that you had. It was really uh, helpful. Yes, absolutely. I think that's one thing which from day one, uh, uh, we had sort of, you know, uh, ensured that if we are doing something and which is uh, so specific, we need to ensure that we, we have all the cards out there and, and we don't, you know, fall back on any of the things. But, uh, but, but, but what worked as a, or maybe what came as a surprise to us was the e-mediation pilot that we did. Yeah. And uh, and mm -hmm. at such a large yeah. scale and the kind of uh, participation that we saw, the kind of uh, interaction we saw, in fact, the kind of emails that we received from the customers, even they were so happy that they could participate from their comfort of, uh, of their homes, they could resolve the matter and within a few yeah. seconds, the matters were disposed of. Uh, and I think that's where, uh, you know, that ease of use, the adoption has increased over the period of time. So, I agree. so yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing those insights. And uh, so just as Nanda joke, now with, with the corporates and MSMEs, you know, really adopting ODR at such a growing speed. And, and Mr. Sarad just spoke about his experience of uh, having ODR into the picture for both arbitrations and mediation. In your view, what will be the role of courts for the advancement of ODR? Well, firstly, I would like to know what kind of matters were referred on this ODR platform because from my personal experience, let me tell you, there was this particular company which is into 
uh, uh, I wouldn't name the company. It's into online education and create, creating content. They were deluged with matters of deficiency of service before the consumer for us. Two years back, they contacted me and they took my consent that if I could function as their ombudsman. I position. If my decision goes against you, you would have to agree to it. Otherwise, the consumer have faith in the ombudsman which you have appointed. They agreed. A platform was put in place, which was again an online dispute resolution where the complaints which were filed, they were to be taken cognizance of. The, the, I also provided the formatting of the complaints so that the layperson sometimes does not know what are the relevant facts required by the person to be stated they tend to put in certain facts which are irrelevant in law or they are inadmissible in evidence. We created all that and not a single, not a single consumer who had any grievance came on that platform. Now, since nobody came, Okay. I I think we lost uh, Justice Pradeep Nandaji. Maybe Cora, you sold us dream, and we got cheated, and so that distinction between puffing up and stating wrong facts and enticing probably. So first of all, you tell me that what are the kinds of disputes. and you've charged a penal interest and the fellow says, okay, wave off my penal interest, do that. Now, those are simple little matters. There's hardly any adjudication involved. Have you referred, anyone is referred to a case of, say, a deficiency of service that <coughs> I gave my, um, I wanted to make an RTGS transaction. In my form, I gave bank account number so-and-so and uh, while feeding it in the system, you put it in a wrong account number and you were not redressing. What kind of disputes did you refer under your, your online platform? So ask uh, that question is, uh, to me, I would like to take it an answer. Typically, the kind of complaints that we've referred are uh, suits for basically claim for money that is owed to the bank. So, and uh, a simple loan, simple loan default, and uh, where the customer has some outstanding to uh, pay so to it's us. It's not much of a factual adjudication, which is no, no, those are not the cases that we those are a separate segment of cases against the bank, mm -hmm. which are basically customer initiated ones. Mm -hmm. So, the ones that we initiate are mostly uh, the recovery related cases where mm -hmm. we have something to recover from the customer. Okay. And uh, in our case in particular, since uh, the arbitration cases that uh, or the accounts that qualify for arbitration are the ones which are below 20 lakhs, mm -hmm. because the, otherwise it goes to the DRT. Uh, at least for the banks, uh, we are to move the DRT for making any recovery. How many cases of this kind would you have referred where somebody says normal clauses are 2.5? above the prime lending rate or the rate set by the RBI. How okay. many cases are where somebody says that you have not been making proper interest calculations? So we would have that separately as cases filed by customers. Typically, it goes to a consumer court. Or no, but have you, have, have you no. attempted those on your no, own? We have not. We have not attempted those. So it means that the contentious ones, not. These are matters probably which don't Mostly, even have any yeah. adjudication. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just to say, in fact, your bank manager can solve them. No, it's not a question of solving because ultimately uh, a large segment of these cases would be ones where the customer refuses to pay us. 
and we are forced to initiate some kind of no, a on what ground he just he has he has no reasons he gives you no reasons he just doesn't respond he doesn't doesn't respond he's either not contactable or then we try to send yes. legal notices and uh, okay. there is no response from the customer side okay so uh, i i just probably add a couple of points out here so so basically of course as you rightly mentioned like there are different kinds of disputes and uh, i'm sure going forward uh, all different kinds of disputes also would be you know referred for odr but today at the nascent stage where odr is uh, we of course start with start somewhere right and with these kind of disputes also where let's say it's one particular company trying to recover money from somebody else when you see that with an online platform they get the chance to participate and they get a chance to put forth their uh, issues which they have gone through and then come up with a amicable resolution that's where odr has actually been able to make a difference because what has happened is that the participation increases the number of settlements with the number of settlements going up of course the courts are, are the backlog which is there it is not getting added in fact it is getting reduced so that's how odr has actually been able to make a difference when it comes to the financial services sector so my my question towards you was that how do you think the courts can actually enable for promotion of odr do you think there are certain steps that the courts could take which could help us well as i i think i answered your question courts will look at it if cases which require a hard core adjudication not of a very disputed kind if they are resolved by you and you create the data then surely it will happen got it got it and and so from the perspective that you know let's say uh, when we talk about arbitrations right uh, uh, the entire process of getting an award uh, that is mm. half the battle then the remaining half uh, you know starts as the enforcement of it it's the Enrique. enforcement do you do you feel that there could be some uh, solutions out there that uh, you know the judiciary or the government together if there could be something which could be built that anything that is going through a fast track mechanism through an odr platform can there be a faster way of Ad, uh, you know executing those proceedings do you think something well, if there is if there is no assets then what can you do if there is no asset left what can you do that's the right. fair fair enough sir. if you are speaking on arbitration let me tell you i feel if the bar is more proactive 95% of the high end arbitration disputes relating to infrastructure contracts supply contracts are capable of being resolved without any evidence everything is documented if we are precise if we are concise i can guarantee that if the bar raises its standards you can have these awards in less than a month of the completion of the ple the pleadings would require hardly any time but let's not forget one party in every dispute knows that it is a weak party and the attempt is to somehow or the other drag it on so it's like the chicken the hen and the egg because in courts matters get dragged on so that becomes an incentive to one party to continue and if these disputes get decided very fast then that incentive goes and it itself becomes self propelling now the problem is how do you break this impasse how do you actually break it and i think the only way you can break it is if we have a good proactive bar if we have in house counsel who are using technology for example issues of delays in construction contracts if you can draw up your critical paths to be followed in the construction schedules you can move extremely extremely fast 
supply and delivery contracts. It is, but the real stakeholders are the lawyers. I, I get that. And, and actually that takes me to my next question. So Komil, according to you, you know, what would be the low role of legal firms when it comes to expanding the reach of ODR? You know, we just spoke about this, that right now we are dealing with a certain category of disputes, right? So we are dealing with small to mid value disputes uh, where we feel that ODR would be the most conducive way to resolve disputes. But with legal firms having, you know, exposure to larger organizations, uh, larger value contracts, do you think ODR can go beyond the small to mid value category, which right now it is focused at? There are lots of things that you've asked me all together, <laughs> but I will try to address it. I think in this ADR, ODR conversation, uh, you know, there are four stakeholders in ODR specifically. So starting with judiciary, the lawyers, the clients, and then the ODR technology vendors uh, or technology companies. So let's start with the judiciary. And I'm not going to go very far. It's just last month that there are so there's so many uh, you know statements and there's so much of talk about using of AI and uh, using of ADR, uh, you know, and uh, trying to speed up access to justice by the Supreme Court, by the Rajasthan High Court, Gujarat High Court, third uh, of August. Justice Sanjay Kishan Paul just spoke about, you know, he, he said this, that if every case has to see the lower court and has to reach the Supreme Court, then we will not be able to, you know, sort these pendencies even in the next 500 years. And therefore we must use ADR methods. Now we, we are talking about ADR and then we are also talking about ODR. Now here I also find it important to mention one judgment that I saw again of 3rd of August by the Ilabad High Court, uh, which where the High Court has declined, has rejected a transfer, a matrimonial dispute transfer application on the, on, in the view of the video conferencing rules in 2020. Now that's very important because the courts are now supporting online hearing. So if online is possible and complicated matters is possible online, then for sure ODR is possible. And with the support of the judiciary, talking about use of technology, talking about use of AI, ADR methods, for sure ODR is possible. Now we come to the clients. Clients will always and always want to, you know, want a productive, uh, fast access to justice, will want to keep the, uh, you know, cost minimum and try to get, uh, you know, quick resolution. And it's all about, you know, keeping the cost low and having, um, you know, quick access and convenience. Convenience, if you can get access to justice with convenience. So clients will always be open to it, I feel. Uh, then coming to lawyers, we spoke about awareness in the first question. You know, I think uh, lawyers are, um, slowly the mindset is changing. We, if we keep on imagining that the mindset will change on its own, that will not happen. So we as responsible people who are aware and who are seeing the benefits or are trying to, you know, bring about a transformation in law, we owe that responsibility to create awareness. And for sure, the lawyers who are aware, they are open to this. They are definitely open. Now we come to the legal tech uh, providers, such as yourself. I think that is a very, very important uh, you know, stakeholder in this entire conversation, because uh, if we are getting the support from all other stakeholders, then the fourth stakeholder has to have that, has to prove it right. You know, you have to have that uh, strong, uh, you know, standing. You, your platform should be that good that it is, uh, you know, it is catering to all the needs of the uh, dispute resolution. It is uh, able to withstand the pressure. It is able to withstand the, uh, you know, the load uh, and that you are continuously improving because, you know, we are still in the learning phase. It's a very, very new phase. So there are going to be lots of things that you will learn as you go. But remember, lawyers will give you just one chance. The judiciary will give you one chance. So, you know, you have to be ready. So when we talk about small to small tickets right now, can we move to big ticket? For sure we can. But we have to be ready for that. And when, you know, for small ticket, I think we are ready. For big ticket, there's a lot of learning that will go into getting ready. 
And when we say we are ready, we must be ready because that's our one chance. And you know, with all of the support that we are getting, uh, we should definitely make it happen. No, those are some great insights, and uh, it's a bit scary also when you say <laughs> that. Oh, you just get one chance, but uh, I'm sure. I'm sure with. Uh, with the with the but then see look the at the amount of support like, you're getting as well right so there's absolutely. so much of support that uh, you know going wrong is it, it won't happen if you do absolutely. the whole work well. i think i think it's the best time for a legal tech entrepreneur to be alive in this country because the kind of uh, support that uh, we are getting from the judiciary government state any stakeholder the corporates msmes and even law firms uh, I think it's it's a phenomenal time to be alive in and we Absolutely. feel, you know, sometimes when people tell us that, oh, you started way too early and your idea was a little ahead of, ahead of its time and I just tell them that, trust me, we were getting prepared for it. Now, I feel we wouldn't have spent those many years uh, in finding the right fit and, you know, kept persisting. We wouldn't be ready for what we have been, you know, given at the moment and what it, what the kind of opportunities that are coming through. So Absolutely. yes, uh, I think that those are some great insights. So uh, Mr. Sarath, now we've heard from Justice Nandajog and, and Komal both, uh, you know, from the legal as well as uh, from the court's perspective that how, you know, conducive environment for ODR could be built. Now, when we speak from the corporate's perspective, right? So how do you envision adoption or evolution and integration of ODR in the legal departments of organizations. And, and let's say if that happens, what sort of support do you seek from the executive and the legislature? See, this, uh, in fact, um, um, my views on this are a little, it goes both ways. There are positives to it, there are negatives also to it. The fact of the matter is arbitration is something that if you remember, after the act came into force, a lot of the banks and NBFCs jumped into the bandwagon. They all had a clause incorporated into loan agreements uh, that they would go in for arbitration. And uh, most of us were struggling initially. But now we are currently in a phase where you have a lot of uncertainty prevailing over arbitration because of, you would know the recent judgments and all. <clears throat> one was the Tata Capital one where Disclosures by arbitration became an issue. Arbitrators became an issue. The other one is that Perkins Eastman judgment. So there's a lot of uncertainty prevailing over there. Uh, we would uh, prefer a more stable kind of an approach from <coughs> judiciary. And in fact, uh, another issue with arbitration is that uh, somewhere there's a feeling that uh, it's mostly built where the act itself is on the premise that it caters to a high stake arbitration, not much the smaller ones that we keep doing in bulk. So if you look at it, if you read both these judgments somewhere, it comes out that it should not be something which is exercised by a corporate for commercial transaction, at least at a smaller stake. So that's where mm -hmm. we stand in terms of arbitration. So. The, that reservation we always will hold. When it comes to adoption of technology, into uh, there are two sides to it. In fact, uh, if you look at section 138 and section 25, that we, most of us who are into commercial or banking and NBFCs, we do a lot of uh, uh, negotiable instrument act cases. Also, now payment of settlement act also has come into the purview. We do a lot of it. So what has happened here is that if you go to some, leave alone the tier one, tier two locations, if you go to locations which are not tier one and tier two, filing a case under section 25 of Payment and Settlements Act is a very difficult proposition even today. You have to go there, make the magistrate understand what it is all about. And then, so it's so difficult that sometimes we even wonder why we should be doing it. So. That kind of, uh, that is actually a little discouraging for us. On the other hand, you also have uh, some um, co some magistrates which are in the uh, rural areas where they go ahead and they have in fact allowed us to serve summons on WhatsApp. Mm. Some of the summons are being sent on WhatsApp. In fact, we, we are the ones who did it first, but 
that was really encouraging even in mumbai also right. we had a scenario where courts allowed us service online service of uh, summons which helps a great lot so the adoption part in fact when we started the your initiative of uh, online arbitration there were many players in fact major banks were um, they made uh, public declarations that they are going into this and all that after that i have not heard much about it yes so today we have a lot of enquiries coming in from lot of banks in fact i have got enquiries from banks asking me how how does it work is it something that we can try out and uh, they are more interested in moving to this platform so yes. for us it's a compulsion because at some level we might not be getting typically from a bank perspective a retail banking unit legal unit like mine would be filing lakhs of cases across the country current litigation volumes are huge <clears throat> so basically for us we are under pressure to deliver uh in terms of uh, recovering money from delinquent customers and all that mm-hmm. so we are on the lookout for such innovative things some somewhere we find it is lacking for the the typical or the conventional judicial um recourses that we have the legal recourses that we have are not paying off we want to get into something more innovative which is more efficient which is faster and can be adapted so this certainly is one um there will be lag which i am telling you because you are fighting a system of lawyers lawyers are used to doing things in a certain way legal managers we look at all the executive uh, people who are working with legal unit they are also very much used to a certain way of doing things changing that approach is a little difficult but we don't have a choice mm-hmm. and uh, one of the i think uh, mm-hmm. changes that you might have noticed is after covid that the pace of adapt, adopting a yes. new technology has increased people have realized that we don't have a choice we need to do something so right. that's where uh, i think it is it's got a future mm-hmm. well i bet it's had one thing as you said you said uncertainty perkins judgment and all well arguable but when perversity can be seen in the system and then you find and of course that was the result of big corporates having pocket arbitrators awards which were shockingly barren where probably the arbitrator was bearing his privies unabashed so the court had to intervene and that is where forums like presol 360 which that independent bodies don't forget that under the arbitration law you can have a dispute resolution independent body and that is where presolve 360 because presolve 360 is not your nominated arbitrator it's a forum yeah. so that exactly answers where we started that that independence trust and yet in conformity with the arbitration law and and when nita yog did say the problem here is we make huge policy statements has niti aayog gone out and nominated bodies like presol 360 as institutions recognized for purposes of arbitration answer is no that's the problem and once that takes place then even your high end matters also can be revoked so i i i i completely agree with you sir in fact uh, it just feels that you know you you spoke about uh, something that you know we we constantly have no answers to because uh, yeah there's a to make statements we wanted we will do it that's fine but when comes the final step then do it they are not doing it they just not doing it but it's nice right. thanks i think have taken the first step and they should go into the higher levels of dispute resolution itself it 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 should work it's yes. sort of creating so one, uh, one yeah one small point i wanted to make here in fact i was surprised because you might have heard of this eclgs scheme it's a 
uh, credit line guarantee scheme, which was recently during COVID, the government had launched. So under the scheme, there is a guarantee for the lender. So if in case we lend basis the government scheme and uh, there is a default, we are entitled to claim uh, the whatever is 75% of what has been lent from the government. So in that scheme, there appears to there was a clause which said an arbitration award would not amount to a legal because one of the preconditions for claiming guarantee is you should initiate a legal recourse against the customer and provide the proof of that legal initiation to NGCTC, which is a trust which disburses the guarantee amount. So they have come out with a guideline which says that arbitration award will not be a valid uh, proof of having initiated legal. So on one hand, while well, we all want arbitration to work in this country, mm. there is equally the signs are yeah, not... One bad. step forward and two yeah. steps back. Backward, yeah. <laughs> yeah that is the tragedy. <laughs> have you well, gone uh, to the Niti Aayog with this data, with this issue and ask them to put it in implementation no you haven't so we've been uh, honestly if i if i speak about this we've been uh, licensing whether it's the niti aayog whether in fact the 2019 amendment of the arbitration and conciliation act which spoke about the formation of arbitration council of india uh, so we've been coordinating we've been continuously licensing with the department of legal affairs as well that here is an institution, we are working with 40 plus corporates now, we've done, we've got a lot of data, we've been able to, you know, uh, resolve disputes amicably while the process of arbitration is going on. What is happening on that front? And yes, Aman, the answer is very simple. Go and attend any seminar. And I've always maintained as a judge, the seminars are not to pat yourself on the back. They are forums where you have to do serious talk. You have to find out what went wrong, where, accept it, and find solutions as to how you can take forward. But what do we see in these uh, seminars in India? Patting on the back. I did this, we did this, this was great, that was great, fine. Then you will never take yourself forward. How, do we critically appreciate the wrongs which we have committed? Do we try to find out aberrations in the system? Do we come out with solutions? That is what is needed. A okay. fundamental approach to, with honesty. That is needed. Absolutely. I think the shift in attitude uh, is, is the most important thing, as you rightly yes. pointed it out. But then, unfortunately, that child who said that the emperor is wearing no clothes, so he then was, he got a spanking from his parents. He was sent to bed without supper. And the message is, protect your butts and don't poke your fingers in the butts of others. <laughs> well, that's a great analogy that you just... Well, you just... well we are, as I said... I would be doing a wrong when I say that at these forums, we don't really look at ourselves and find that where are we going wrong. If we don't say that, there's no point. There's no point right. to say this is good, that is good. But then beyond a point, we can't take it forward. We have to take it forward. Yes, yes. So, but I'll, I'll like to add a couple of points out here. And again, just coming out of, uh, you know, our experiences and uh, Mr. Sarad just spoke about, you know, how uh, typically in, in tier one, tier two cities, it's yet, you know, uh, it, the adoption, uh, when it comes to court or understanding about, uh, you know, e-arbitration and how the process has gone through is yet better. But very recently, you know, it's, it's if, I, if I speak about the last three or four months, uh, when we've seen that, you know, with certain other uh, enterprises where, you know, the 90 day period has gone off after the award has been passed and they've gone ahead with execution petition filing, we've seen that even in tier three, tier four cities, successfully EPs have been filed. Uh, you know, the courts are understanding the fact that how electronic arbitration was working. In fact, in certain courts, we received the uh, 
you know, a lot of uh, initial objections to which are bound to happen because, you know, anything which is disruptive in nature, we cannot expect that these teething issues are not going to happen. Uh, and, and I feel as a fraternity, uh, as a community, all of us will have to find a solution to that together. So I'll just give one or maybe a couple of examples that, you know, with this one particular enterprise, uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, in Jaipur, the, the courts in Jaipur, where they said that, you know, this is this is not possible. You don't have a, uh, it's an e-stamped award. And how can you have an e-stamped award? You need to have a physically stamped award. The awards are also e-signed. How is it possible? So there were all these objections which were raised. And uh, of course, the advocate of that company was filing. So our scope, of course, ends when the award is mm -hmm. passed. But many a times when we have to provide that admin support, we have to provide the documents, the companies do reach out to us. And when we just address this, so it was just a phone conversation where we made them understand how electronic arbitration works, how the trace and trail of proceedings do we have in the form of a Section 65B certificate, how, uh, you know, this entire e-stamped and e-signed award, we shared a couple of articles with them, which made them understand. And those objections in the next three days itself, uh, they were able well, to take it off and the, the execution. Well, uh, Aman, the answer to this is very simple. I also do arbitrations. We all do it online. In your first procedural order, you record all this. Correct. Would be through VC, filing would be through uh, soft copies. Uh, the, uh, the digitally signed orders would be treated signed orders, the final award would also be digitally signed. It would be electronically transmitted. Where does the law say that the award has to be physically delivered? Okay. It says that. Just because for, for years and years and years and years, we were used to it. We think it's become a part of the law. But right. if you know that these issues can come up, why, don't, why can't you also in your rules provide that? Provide that in your rules and be done with it. Yes. <clears throat> have you That's amended exactly. your rules? Have you amended your rules? We did have objections. Yes. We in fact most in fact all of these points have been incorporated in our rules and as you rightly mentioned, even the first procedural order Correct. in that the entire procedure is mentioned. It's so all. That's, yeah. Yes, that's exactly what, you know, when we even deal with, uh, when we speak to enterprises and when we convince them, these are the basic, uh, you know, concerns which are there. And, and I believe uh, only with more adoption and with more use of these kind of tools, it is only going to become a new norm, which has yes. been, uh, you know, an old norm. So, uh, you know, so I, I, I think we, we've spoken uh, right from, you know, how ODR was and now how it could be and, you know, what could be the future. So, Komal, my, my final question towards you would be that, you know, what piece of advice as, you know, coming from somebody who has been in the legal fraternity, coming from somebody who has been, you're pushing for uh, tech in legal and and this entire audience, our audience predominantly would be GCs or legal heads of companies. What advice would you want them to take away when it comes to adopting ODR as their first choice, first choice dispute resolution? So I will say whether a company or an individual going to the court is a costly affair, emotionally, financially, and time-wise. So my first take, I mean, if I was even as a person, I would want to avoid the courts always. So, uh, you know, going, you, if there is this um, acceptable method of resolving the disputes, uh, dispute outside of the court, um, all votes for that, for sure. Now, whether it is the first choice for everyone, that I would say depends from case to case. Every case has a different profile, different jurisdiction, different, uh, you know, money at stake. Um, for companies, it's always commercial disputes. So therefore, I would say that, uh, you know, we should definitely, the companies must consult their trusted legal advisors and see what uh, best can be done, you know. So whether ODR can be applied to that kind of matter, if yes, then go ahead. If not, then you have various remedies. So I think um, 
as a citizen of the country, as an individual, as a company, everybody wants, you know, convenience from home. Everybody, nobody is wanting to, you know, go through the pain really. Uh, but there are times when you have to go to the court, you can't avoid it. So uh, I'd say as much as possible, try avoiding the costly into the categories of emotionally, financially, and time-wise, and uh, always speak to your uh, trusted legal advisor, a law firm, your uh, whoever, your individual you know, practitioner, uh, they will be the best people. So therefore, again, concluding, I think we need to do a great job with awareness. So the lawyers are aware that this is a medium where disputes can be resolved. Uh, the clients also need to be made aware that this is one of the choices for you. And then both the lawyers and the clients can discuss with each other to agree whether this is a medium that suits that particular matter uh, to be resolved online. Great. No, that, no, that, I think that's that's important. I think all each and every stakeholder will have to play an important and active role in, in actually pushing for or, or catalyzing a system which is much more conducive for ODR. So, I think uh, it's it's been great to you know hear each of your thoughts. Uh, we've we've got a good discussion also running in the middle. Uh, you know, speaking about some of the concerns or challenges that we face, and uh, you know, I'm sure with 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 more and more uh, you know seminars or discussions like these, uh, we will be creating more awareness. Uh, I'm sure if you know out of 40 people right now who are you know participating in in this discussion if there are certain similar concerns thought processes or certain uh, roadblocks which would be coming in uh, to have odr as the first choice resolution or at least for a certain kind of disputes i'm sure we've been able to address uh, you know few of their concerns with with the discussions that we've had and uh, probably what we can do by keeping uh, you know the the time uh, aspect of you know uh, you know it, i mean keeping that in mind if we have certain questions which have come in and uh, i can just take up a few of them and uh, you know maybe uh, if anyone from the panelists who could go and who could answer this question so if for the ones which have been directed to somebody i'll i'll, I'll definitely speak about it so uh, Mr. Sarad, there's uh, okay. So there's a question which has come to you that what type of cases are you referring for e-mediation? Okay, so e-mediation basically as a tool, as a legal tool for recovery for me, works in a small ticket, typically a small ticket kind of a scenario. So uh, we are looking at cases which are close to a five lakh or below five lakh of amount involved. Those are the ones which get uh, responded to by customers also because it's easier rather than going to court and spending a lot of money on it. People tend to respond to that and even come forward for a settlement. So those are the kind of cases that we have mostly targeted under e-mediation. These are uh, local dollars, e-mediation, conciliation on all. Uh, it typically works on small ticket sizes. So that's the one that I would look for if I am to progress with e-mediation. Got it. Got it. Great. Uh, okay, we'll go. Okay, so the next question is that uh, for a financial institution, how arbitration would help if the opposite party are adherent to pay? Uh, hey. So if I, I'm sure if they are adherent to pay, no. no then there's no question of. <laughs> All right. I, I, I'm not sure if I got the I got the context of the question right, uh, but maybe we can move on to the next one. Uh, doing online arbitration is not a hurdle. The execution of award decree, I think that is something that we have discussed. Uh, we all are aware that, you know, it's it's 50 percent of the battle. One once you get an award, the remaining 50 percent, yes, is in the courts. Uh, and, and that is something that none of us can uh, do you know, anything, do anything about. about. Yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, as long as, as, as Justice Pradeep Rajak said that, you know, we go, we constantly push, uh, you know, think tanks like Niti Aayog and so many other stakeholders to actually take those or implement those actions, which were spoken about. And then, you know, only we'll be able to see that. But I'm certain with the way things are going, uh, two years, three years down the line, if we are sitting across uh, virtually and having the same discussion, I'm sure a lot would have been improved until then. 
All right. Uh, uh, so the next question is, uh, uh, wouldn't having a legislation that all bank, if not private, claims below so and so amount has to be sought to be recovered via ODR. Well, we would love it if there would be a, res a legislation yeah, like it. that. <laughs> it, we would be more than happy if that happens. But uh, but yes, would would love to would love to hear your thoughts, sir. <laughs> so, so, uh, just as Namraj, what do you feel about this? Well, surely this? it would un it would uh, remove a lot of clutter from the courts. It certainly would be. Because as what is emerging is these cases hardly have any legal dispute of a real kind in it. Right. Right. And and I think with, with, with an ODR platform, what could really happen is that for somebody who was not participating just because he is a few hundred kilometers away right. and he could not yes. really, you know, give his side of the story. If they could do that from a recorded message or a WhatsApp message, I think that's where yes. uh, things could really make more sense. All right, uh, I'll move on to the next one. Uh, Niti Aayog came out with an ODR policy. Niti Aayog two, Niti Aayog one came out with an ODR policy. Niti Aayog two will hopefully start announcing acceptable institution for arbitration and mediation. Yeah, Actually, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs did impanel institution, but nobody refers matters to them. If nothing, let government banks and government companies start referring matters to them. All right, uh, I think this is. Uh, not a question, but anyway, I think it was a suggestion uh, that how you know inst arbitral institutions can be involved. I think we've been striving for that, so we've been constantly uh, working and speaking with the, the Department of Legal Affairs, Department of Justice, uh, and been pushing them that yes, uh, you know what was amended as per the 2019 Act, if it can be formed. So uh, just for the for the uh, you know if, if I would like to share a good news out here, if I may call it so. Uh, very recently, we've got an update uh, from somebody in the de Department of Legal Affairs that by the end of this year, the, a the ACI would be formed. The rules are in process of being formed. And uh, very soon, yes, there will be arbitral institutions which would be graded and impaneled out there. So uh, that's, that's some movement happening out there. So hopefully, it'll be a, it'll be a great news for everyone uh, if that goes through. Yes. And, uh, oh, wow, this is an interesting question. How do you see the future of dispute resolution via ODR with respect to disputes arising in the metaverse world? Also, my opinion, we need ODR integrated with justice systems for the fate to be developed in masses and leading more towards justice system, mm -hmm. towards an inclusive justice system. Mm -hmm. So anyone who would like to take this up? Oh, I would say that we should uh, probably concentrate on solving the problems in the physical world before we get into <laughs> yes <laughs> it's it's a then, question which looms large in the field of <laughs> metaphysics hmm? yeah. so, but but do you uh, uh, you know this just brings up another question that do you see that i'm sure uh, right now, it just this idea just feels like a fantasy. But do you feel that maybe four years, five years down the line, we can expect that even arbitrations, mediations happening uh, in in the in the metaverse world, and it is happening in a way that you know people from different cities, different countries, and cross border disputes where you can actually feel that the person and the mediator is there in one room. Do you think that is something which is a which is a near future the or? When you see Star Wars, <laughs> so everything looks very surreal. And after some time, what is surreal starts looking very, very much real. We have yet to take our small steps. So let's not talk of the big steps. Let's cross the smaller hurdles first. Absolutely. Absolutely. And oh, maybe, maybe, maybe not five years, maybe two decades, <laughs> and maybe another <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> you know, to accelerate the whole thing. Yeah. Well, that's 
so I'm thankful for all three of you to you know join this panel discussion and give your uh, opinions and your suggestions for so many things that we've been striving together to to work for. And uh, we just hope that uh, you know some of the concerns that we spoke about. Uh, maybe a few months down the line, uh, I'm sure those concerns would be of the past and there'll be some new concerns to be talk, to, to be speaking about. And, and we all would be, each and every one of us would be responsible to make that happen. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining this pleasure. call. And uh, it, was, it was such a pleasure to host all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thank, thank you, you everyone for joining this call. Uh, all the participants who've removed your precious time to join and and to put forward all your questions in front of us. Thank you so much. Thank you.